Welcome to the panel six of this extremely significant and important seminar. And uh, I should express my gratefulness to, the, to our colleagues, the organizers of the seminar, New Strategy Center, and uh, of course, uh, all the Romanian institutions and, and personalities who practically put together in these two days ideas, perceptions with regard to maybe to one of the most important and significant cries we are crisscrossing in this period of time. As we are fully aware, uh, Russia war against Ukraine is similar with fighting a new Cold War. Practically, in other words, it represents an existential confrontation between Russia and the West. The war, it might be also a chance to practically rebuild the sense of security and stability in the region of the Black Sea and at the level of the whole community. For six months, Ukraine has been heroically, I should say, resisting against Russian aggression. It is an admirable mobilization of entire Ukrainian people in this war and the mobilization of the democratic world to help Ukraine. How do you see this evolution and what is going to happen, taking into account that practically we are discussing about maybe a frozen conflict, but also the partition of the responsibilities within the European and Euro-Atlantic area, it is up to our distinguished guests, panelists, to present to you. You will have the opportunity, of course, to address questions, points of clarification, and I'm very sure, due to the ex uh, extraordinary experience of our Romanian colleague, Minister Vasile Dinko, and also our Ukrainian friends, Minister Reznikov, who will submit a, a message, a video message, but also with the help of uh, Deputy Minister of Defense of Ukraine, Maybe we shall highlight what is important to consider for the future and what might be the perspectives with regard to what is happening in this part of the world. Mr. Oleksiy Reznikov, Minister of Defense of Ukraine, allow me to introduce some points of his biography. He's the Minister of Defense since 4th of November 2021. Mr. Reznikov previously occupied positions in the government of Ukraine, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Reintegration of Temporarily Occupied Territories of Ukraine, and Deputy Head of the Kiev City State Administration. As I understood, he was kind enough, His Excellency, to submit a video message addressed to this seminar. Organizers and participants of the forum, dear colleagues, thank you for the opportunity to present the Ukrainian position at this important platform. I would like to greet my colleague, the Minister of National Defense, Vasily Dinku, and thank the Romanian government and nation for their support of Ukraine. We deeply appreciate it. My talk is to be presented at the panel discussion that focuses on the deterrence policy and the problem of frozen conflicts. In my opinion, the very idea of deterrence is a sign of inertia. It has already lost its relevance. It may cause further strategic mistakes. If we really want peace, safety, and development in the Black Sea region and on the Balkans, we need to change our philosophy. The word deterrence needs to be replaced with the word victory. Striving to win and readiness to work for that victory should be the basis of our strength. And to accomplish that, we need to seize the initiative. Let me explain my logic. 
the NATO summit in Bucharest in 2008 made it abundantly clear that deterrence was the wrong strategy. Ukraine's and Georgia's entry to the alliance were blocked. Essentially, Russia was given the upper hand. After that, Russia began to plan the place and time of its next strikes. First, it attacked Georgia. Then it attacked Ukraine, occupying Crimea and parts of Donbass. From 2014 and until the beginning of the full-scale invasion this winter, don't provoke Russia was the phrase that the Ukrainian leadership heard most often from our partners. That is the same policy of deterrence in action. I have personally heard this phrase dozens of times. All that led to the full-scale war. That's the, that's the way Russia works. If the Kremlin wants to attack, it can provoke itself just fine. The only argument that can sway Russia is strong resistance. Once it means resistance, the Kremlin begins to offer goodwill gestures. In March, April, the Russian army was crushed outside Kyiv and fled from the northern region of Ukraine. Russians fled from the Snake Island after being dealt crushing blows by the Ukrainian army. The modern weapons that we received from our partners contributed this outcome. Therefore, if we are serious in our desire to preserve peace, we have to demonstrate that we are ready to mount strong resistance to the aggressor. Once the Kremlin meets resistance, it instantly shows openness to dialogue. Within this context, I would like to mention several practical factors that concern the Black Sea region and the Balkans. First, Real peace in the region will only be possible after Crimea is once again a Ukrainian seaside resort and not a Russian military base. Any other view is self-delusion. The liberation of Crimea and the restora restoration of the Ukrainian territorial integrity and sovereignty should be the goal of every power that really wishes the peace, prosperity and safe navigation in the region. Second. War can only be stopped with a comprehensive approach. Victory over Russia on the battlefield should be key component of the approach. Ukraine has already proven that Russia can be defeated. Many expected Kyiv to fall within three days. Russians wants to halt a military parade on its central street. We did organize a Russian military parade to celebrate Ukraine's Independence Day on August 24. But with a twist, we have brought dozens of destroyed Russian military vehicles to the central street of Kyiv. Ukraine needs support to defeat an enemy this strong. First and foremost, we need weapons and ammunition. As Winston Churchill has had once put in, give us the tools and we will finish the job. Third, real unity is important for defeating Russia. Cases like the ones where the Russians were allowed to bring in S-300 systems through the strait should be made impossible. This sends a very bad signal. Unity in upholding sanctions is an important component of our victory. Let me remind you that not a year ago the world's leading countries were trying to persuade Ukraine that Russia should be allowed to complete Nord Stream 2. Ukraine kept insisting that this is not the matter of energy. This is, is Russian's weapon against Europe. Now, Germany itself insists that it, it not longer holds even Nord Stream 1 to be a reliable energy source. The Kremlin, after all, is blatantly using gas blackmail. Many states will feel the negative effect of the Russian aggression this year because of the rising prices of energy sources among other resources. This is, could be, have been avoided if the, only the free world had agreed to take preventative steps against the aggressor. Now, Europe has already imposed almost every sanctions that we suggested as preventative measures to prevent the full-scale war. The price has already gone up, though, because there is the right time for every step. Under no circumstances should be succumbed to pressure. The price will only keep rising with every new iteration. Fourth, 
If we consider the situation strategically, it is clear that the security space of Europe and the NATO will be vulnerable without Ukraine. It is in the security interest of the entire region to strengthen Ukraine. Let me draw an analogy with the Northern Europe. The balance of powers in the north of Europe has changed substantially. Russians' allied assault units have suffered great losses in Ukraine. These units were sent to Ukraine from the many regions, including those along the EU's and NATO's border in the northwest. The risk of Russians, Russia's aggression in those regions went down significantly. Similarly, Russia had essentially accepted Sweden's and Finland's entry, entry to the NATO without protest. The Northern European and the Baltic states are now among Ukraine's staunchest partners. Therefore, we should address the situation not only in the short term, but also within the framework of long-term cooperation. Developing Ukraine's air and missile defense systems and combat aviation is a component of the NATO security infrastructure along the eastern flank is one phase of such long-term cooperation. This is a project that will take years, but when it's complete, Europe will become safer by over 1,500 kilometers of protected skies. Fifth and last, the Balkans are home to the nations that truly value their dignity and freedom. They have been building their countries and democracies for more than 30 years now. Several countries of the region from Bulgaria to Montenegro have elections coming up this autumn. Russia has learned to manipulate democratic tools in order to destabilize the situation. Therefore, I would like to ask everybody who is now considering their electoral choices to cast their vote in favor of peace, stability and prosperity not in the favor of the slogans that the Kremlin has been using its attempts to sow division in your society. I have often asked how Ukrainians managed to hold on for six months when nobody gave us more than a couple of days. Aside from the stunning progress of our soldiers, the unity of our nation has been the key component of our resilience. We have shelved every device devices issues until after the victory. Despite all hardships, Ukraine is now a monolith. The social consensus is based on the desire to restore our sovereignty and territorial integrity fully, which requires liberating Crimea and Donbass. Therefore, the war in Ukraine has very slim chances of becoming a frozen country. There may be poses that Russia will use to prepare for the next assault. Meanwhile, Ukrainians have already seen the crimes that Russians commit against our people on the occupied territories. Therefore, the only way to stop the war from becoming an ongoing nightmare for the whole of Europe is to kick the Russian's army out of Ukraine. I am certain that, that will solve a whole range of other frozen conflicts from Moldova to the Caucasus. It is of utmost importance that more of our friends, neighbors and partners recognize that this outcome is in our shared best interest. The sooner we return to normal life, the sooner we can start thinking about working with our shared prosperous future. Thank you for your attention and Slava Ukraini! I also thank Minister Oleksiy Reznikov. Uh, as I understood, uh, he will be in charge for a while uh, due to obvious reasons in a meeting of the government in Kiev. And uh, we shall benefit for the rest of the seminar and, of course, uh, regarding uh, Q&A session of the support of Mr. Alexander Polishku, uh, Deputy Minister of Defense of Ukraine.
um, distinguished minister from 1984 uh, to 2010. He served on command and staff position in units and subdivisions of the armed forces, the general staff of the armed forces of Ukraine and the minister of defense of Ukraine. Uh, after retirement from active duty in 2010, in the rank of uh, Major General, he had senior civil service position in the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine and the Office of National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine. Mr. Deputy Minister will join us soon. And uh, before that, it's a pleasure and honor for me to address the request of Mr. Minister Vasile Dâncu de a se adresa acestui uh, uh, seminar. And then uh, Mr. Vasile Dâncu uh, has been senator uh, between 2004 and 2008 in Romania. He's been the Minister of Public Information in 2004, uh, Minister of Regional Administration, and uh, starting in 2021, he has been the Minister of Defense in Romania. He created two, two sociological uh, research companies uh, marketing and Publicity, Metro Media Transylvania and Romanian Institute for Evaluation and Strategy in 2009. Uh, Minister, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad we are uh, here together discussing about uh, a complicated topic uh, pertaining directly to Black Sea security. Uh, I was uh, glad to see my old friend, the Minister of Defense uh, of Ukraine, uh, Mr. Resnikov. I heard him speaking in Prague as well. Uh, during the meeting of uh, defense ministers of the EU, uh, Alexei comes and he tells us what's happening in Ukraine, and afterwards uh, uh, one has a hard time uh, speaking or uh, holding a geostrategic speech because uh, we uh, feel that his words are heartfelt and uh, he uh, comes with uh, an image of pure reality. He speaks about life and death, about uh, the efforts of a whole nation uh, fighting with a giant uh, and successfully fighting a giant. Of uh, course, uh, this all uh, wouldn't be possible uh, without uh, our common support, the support that uh, has uh, come uh, quite tardy, but uh, it did come. Uh, I have uh, 15 minutes. Uh, I hope I will be able to um, keep time, but uh, please uh, do tell me if uh, I go beyond uh, uh, the time I have allotted. I would like to say a few words about uh, the current state of affairs uh, uh, as we see it in our national defense strategy and uh, the latest development, uh, the uh, NATO strategic concepts uh, after Madrid. Uh, uh, once we'll uh, be able to operationalize it, it uh, uh, is made up of clear and pragmatic measures. Before 1989, uh, we were uh, reminiscing about uh, what uh, Nikolai Yorga was, uh, once said, uh, that is, the, that the Black Sea is our best neighbor and our best friend. Some would say our only friend. It wasn't probably all true. Uh, 
That's a quote Dacă from Nicolae Iorga. I uh, do not astăzi, know. Uh, Marea Neagră well, nu maybe if that was true in the past, uh, we see Și that uh, today uh, the Black Sea um, is no longer a friend friendly area, but a conflict zone. And even the extended Black Sea area is uh, uh, by um, frozen conflicts. It's become uh, an area of instability and insecurity. Cristian Diaconescu probably uh, knows it very well because uh, he worked uh, in the diplomatic field. Uh, it was not easy to speak about this uh, in international uh, meetings. I've been Minister of Defense for only a couple of months now and um, I confess that uh, I found it difficult to, 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 to explain all that when we discussed about the uh, strategic compass, compass or how we would harmonize this strategic compass with the, uh, with the NATO strategic uh, concept. So I had a hard time explaining that the Black Sea is a difficult area and it should be uh, pinpointed on the threats map. Uh, other uh, stakeholders, uh, international stakeholders, uh, we find it hard to understand. Uh, we were in a jumbo meeting, uh, foreign affairs ministers and uh, ministers of defense, and I remember that a uh, high EU official between Bogdan's speech and my own speech, uh, we crossed paths and uh, he told us, well, it's quite uh, difficult to harmonize the uh, NATO strategic concept um, and uh, in the strategic compass, uh, every country's um, uh, concerns or uh, interests. Uh, she, uh, so let me tell you one thing. Lucru if în we have this included in the strategic concept, uh, and Mării Negre, if we have in uh, Mihail Kogalichan uh, in the Black Sea area apărării, uh, concrete pragmatic projects uh, in the field of defense, well, it deci, is owed to our strategic partnership with the U.S. In, uh, uh, we Found, uh, understanding uh, in our American partners uh, from the very beginning, uh, even before all this was transposed in an official document. So, now we have managed to define a whole series of actions. But before going into these actions, uh, I should like to say a few words about uh, uh, the book co-authored by Ben. And I remember something that I read in that book. I am convinced that we will need to reflect on that in the future. He said that one of the uh, 21 lessons uh, was saying something, that is, in order to have a deep integration in the European defense policy, we need more political integration, because without uh, this letter, we'll have a hard time doing the first. I don't know if we will manage to have such political integration, to take further steps of political integration in the EU. However, in a more concrete manner, through its strategic concept, NATO has taken huge strides with regard to this integration uh, and with regard to the defense in the Black Sea area. Uh, Alexei Reznikov, uh, I 
uh, don't want to uh, speak about uh, matters that have already been mentioned here. But I would like to say that things here are complex due to the war in Ukraine, of course. The Russian Federation is quite intent on creating a buffer zone and uh, it's using the frozen conflicts in the extended Black Sea area for that. This brutal uh, and uncalled for military aggression of Russia in Ukraine has completely changed the security environment uh, in the area. We shouldn't forget that the Russian invasion in Ukraine has uh, created tensions in the Western Balkans as well, because the Russian Federation intends to uh, put pressure on the political environment there. Uh, of course, uh, Romania is uh, a balancing factor uh, in the Balkans. We've been and we will be uh, such a, a balancing factor. And we are a security supplier, I should say, in the whole region. Uh, we are reining in these tensions uh, in the Balkans, which are only the effect uh, of what's happening in Ukraine. So, uh, I've been influenced uh, in my th thinking by Ben's book and um, I see uh, what's happening uh, nowadays in the region as a challenge for us. So how to deal with this challenge? We need to support Ukraine so that it, it can uh, go beyond uh, this military conflict. Uh, and uh, we uh, see this concept of the Five Ideas War that uh, Ben purports in uh, his book. Uh, for we see uh, what's happening with the energy crisis for the uh, EU countries. So there's a complex constraint I was talking about yesterday, which is a dangerous one. So so given all these threats, uh, riscul, uh, de, the risk of instability and conflicts undermining the rule of law and peace in the countries in this area as an effect of the Russian war are quite important and are elements that we need to take into account. As of 2014, after the NATO summit in Wales and after the uh, 2016 summit in Warsaw, all high-level meetings took important steps in order to define the uh, deterrence and defense policy on the eastern flank. It's been six months now since the war started in Ukraine, and we have noticed uh, that uh, this is a uh, long-term war. Uh, where the Russian troops uh, are not capable to uh, hold the land that they invaded. And that is why we hope to hear uh, better news from Ukraine, from the counter-offensive in Kherson and in the nearing regions. So we hope that the Ukrainian army will uh, make progress and we hope to hear good news 
ceea ce am putea să numim și ceea ce este un pericol în acest moment, Because uh, this obos- good news oboseală pe care opinia publică could din Europa sau din lume the... O poate avea uh, față de tema uh, ucraina. Acesta este cel mai mare pericol și ceea ce spunem noi mereu este, uh, este foarte bine să uh, ținem ritmul constant al sprijinului pentru uh, prietenii noștri uh, ucrainieni. Aș mai spune câteva lucruri uh, aici. Cred că... Cele două summituri And de anul something acesta, else, I think that the two summits de la, that uh, le-am avut la Bruxelles și cel de la Madrid, cele două summituri NATO, and Madrid, uh, până la urmă au schimbat fundamental natura fundamentally changed posturii colective. The collective cred că în acest moment, paradigm and its NATO, nature. În această zonă poate să facă față so, de securitate I do care believe that NATO is capable to, uh, rând, uh, că, to deal with the uh, security challenges it's faced uh, with uh, at the present time. Spun, uh, And uh, there's been an important decision taken there. I don't know if I should say that, but I would. Nonetheless, the uh, NATO summit in Madrid was the summit of Romania, of the eastern flank, and of the Black Sea region. I say that because we've seen that important decisions with regard to these three uh, aspects have been taken there. Câteva lucruri care sunt urmări practice ale summitului de la Madrid. Like to, nu toate au fost uh, speak about a few de opinia publică. Uh, practical uh, uh, aspects stemming from this summit. Of course, uh, for us, for Romania, it's important to witness this new homogeneity of the eastern flank, uh, the southern uh, area. Um, has been added. We've seen four uh, battle groups uh, come here. So we now have a, a more solid, ro- uh, robust, and coherent uh, flank line. Then uh, President uh, Biden uh, has upgraded uh, U.S. Uh, engagement uh, to brigade level. And then uh, Macron's president's decision to uh, move over to a brigade level uh, is also important, not only for us, but for the entire deterrence and defense uh, posture. Some other aspects, um, bringing ammunition and uh, equipment uh, uh, here on the eastern flank. Uh, it's been mentioned uh, not so often, but it's as important as well. Uh, then uh, anti-missile defense or air defense aspects, improving uh, military mobility as well. We've seen often times that our allies, especially our strategic partners, have had some issues on the eastern flank uh, with this mobility. Now its improvement comes uh, uh, as a step forward. Uh, We've also seen uh, uh, that uh, the uh, training and exercise program uh, has been uh, underlined uh, in uh, Madrid. And it's something we should uh, showcase in our discourse. And a more rapid and efficient political decision process. Sometimes, uh, 
politicians have a hard time uh, living military men um, take the important decision, but uh, we, we should learn to do that. Uh, because as uh, Winston Churchill was saying, yes, strategy can be wonderful, but uh, results are, are what matters matter most. So I think that uh, the uh, Madrid summit has uh, brought us a more uh, rapid uh, decision process. And the new generation warfare and the, 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 the way it's been stressed in Madrid. Uh, Together with the control of our resiliency and the continuous assessment of, uh, uh, of the uh, resiliency of countries on this flank, it's important to have a permanent control or assessment of uh, resilience because even more experienced countries uh, in this uh, areas uh, can help us with resilience, helping us with infrastructure and with a cultural resiliency. Major political stakeholders can be used uh, willingly or not uh, as a tool to undermine re the resiliency of these countries. One last thing. I should like to say I am happy, really happy to have our Ukrainian friends with us. Um, uh, I welcome the Deputy Minister here. I know that uh, there is an important uh, meeting taking place right now. It's important for Europe, for the EU, to uh, have a uh, united, to present a united front. Uh, the strategic compass is uh, a tool which uh, has managed to combine security, diplomatic activity, supporting this uh, mutual interests and Georgia and the Republic of Moldova need to be supported uh, towards their integration and towards uh, an increase in their defense and resilience capacity because they are under threat. We should not forget the uh, heroic resistance of the Ukrainian people uh, faced with this aggression uh, and uh, the whole uh, democratic international community needs to support them. Uh, tirelessly. Let us not get tired uh, because their fight is important and we need to take part in this efforts toward security in the Black Sea region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear Minister. Now, we will move on to the Q&A session of our panel. We benefit from the support and assistance, and I'm again extremely grateful to Deputy Minister Polishuk. And um, allow me, Mr. Minister, summing up some of the questions I've already received, to address the first question to you. So this question sounds like this. How do you see the evolution of the war in the coming months and under what conditions it will be 
be able to talk about a ceasefire, at least from Ukrainians' perspective. Dear ministers, it's a big honor for me to take part in this discussion, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, as you know, we are now in a strong fight with the Russian Federation. We are continuously optimistic about the operations which we currently uh, conduct in Ukraine, not only operation in the south, but the uh, stabilization operation in Donbass, the operation of contained possible threats in Belarus. The success of the implementation largely depends on additional resources what West will be willing to provide for Ukraine. Our current capabilities enough to continue the defense and destroy the plans to and equip the defense system uh, of the operational command of the first item uh, for fortification. And uh, this war we are discussing now are the artillery competition. Additionally, it's a resource competition. Russia's resources were not in place. According to the experts, by the end of this year, Russia will run out of artillery and ammunition reserves. The corrupt system in Russia, about which General Hodges spoke, uh, turned Russia into the colossus on the clay feet, according to the famous saying of another politician. Therefore, as the Minister of Ukraine, not this, in this day, the issue of ceasefire is not the agenda. It will allow Russia to regroup, accumulate forces, resume offensive action with the new strengths. So that is why uh, we are looking for the continuation of our cooperation. Thanks, Romania. Uh, valuable contribution uh, war. We continuously feel in substantial help from Romanian colleagues and uh, well, we will continue our action, I'm quite sure, especially in the Black Sea. I fully agree that uh, for the moment Russia uh, Try to keep their superiority in the blacks, but we need to create a mechanism which will allow us as well a part of security in the blacks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Domnule Ministru Vasile Dincu. Vasile Dâncu, a question from our colleagues and friends. Romania is uh, the EU and NATO country with the longest border with Ukraine and it is uh, the closest uh, neighbor of Ukraine to the Black Sea. Romania has had a substantial contribution to uh, the export of uh, the Ukrainian grains. Um, how can Romania contribute to uh, NATO support for Ukraine because there are severe economic problems among in the EU countries. So how can we um, uh, avoid uh, support fatigue and continue our efforts to support Ukraine? We are still discussing in uh, the public sphere about what we can further do to support Ukraine, considering that we are a neighboring country, we have the longest border, as uh, the question said. 
In the longest border with Ukraine, we've seen two types of support and two very uh, important attitudes. Uh, we had the governmental aid from uh, the very first day of uh, the conflict. We organized a hub in Suchaba, a uh, very important humanitarian hub through which around 300 convoys of aid passed. Those um, convoys came from across Europe and from Romania, and that helping hand mattered a lot. Then more than two million Ukrainians crossed the border to Romania, and uh, we have always had a flow of tens of thousands every day. So social support was granted. Um, we also supported um, grains exportation uh, through our territory, through our ports, and uh, on um, our railway and highways. Uh, we organized uh, the port in Galatz to support the transit of um, ships. Um, so we also made works in Sulina port and Galatz port to support Ukraine. Now, besides all these efforts, the military sent humanitarian aid. We also hospitalized the, the war casualties in our hospitals. In Braza, we have uh, organized the classroom and um, to teach a group of um, young military undergrads. So all these efforts showcase our friendship and support. It's a spontaneous solidarity effort shown to Ukrainian refugees. This is not something that shows our ability to organize ourselves, but it shows our solidarity with our neighbors. We keep in touch with them and support uh, the Ukrainian authorities with uh, all that is necessary. This is why we are keeping our communication lines open 24-7 um, and uh, are ready to help the government officials in Kiev at any time. In all fields, we are trying to provide support, and um, our government uh, receives report, uh, reports every day about refugee management and uh, um, uh, their needs. We supported the Ukrainian refugees with um, everything uh, they needed. The Ministry of Transportation, the Home Affairs Ministry, um, worked together to facilitate uh, the grain uh, transit through Romania. We had barges uh, that um, um, ensured uh, a good transit. 
for the Ukrainian grain. Although we are not the communication champions when it comes to um, our country's efforts, we can guarantee you that the Romanian society won't show support for is um, accusations um, put forward by uh, Russia uh, with respect to weapons we are providing Ukrainians with. Russia is leading a 5G war. It's a hybrid war that started before the 24th of February. Every now and then, a spokesperson from Kremlin um, comes uh, on TV accusing Romania for providing aid, uh, training uh, Ukrainian soldiers, uh, Romania sending uh, mercenaries uh, to Ukraine to fight against Russians. These are hybrid attacks against Romania and the nation, national and international coalition supporting uh, Ukraine to defend its territory. Therefore, these are seen as uh, attempts to manipulate the public opinion. They are part of uh, the manipulation toolkit used by Russia. Probably we will meet in Rammstein. There is a meeting there on the 8th of September with the uh, Support Committee for Ukraine, and we will discuss about our joint positions and Ukraine's needs and the needs of those defending Ukraine right now. We, Romanians, since we are neighbors and friends, we are somehow their defense lawyers. We are specialized and credible since we are a riparian state at the Black Sea, and we are supporting the Ukrainian cause. 100 percent. So we um, keep on uh, consulting each other when it comes to aid provided by the international community. We are an active member of the EU, and there is a need for a continuous effort for communication because the ones uh, that are further away from the eastern flank and the Black Sea should understand from us the needs Ukraine has, the needs uh, the Ukrainian army has, and the political support we should show to Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. Minister. One brief question. In June, two Russian military vessels were entering the Romanian exclusive economic zone. Uh, so were they seen as threats to our um, country? We didn't see uh, them as um, belligerent event. Um, the event seemed like a provocation, uh, but it might have been an accidental um, entry. But now we can say uh, that Russia uh, is not um, presenting a provoking posture towards NATO. But there is an electronic warfare. Um, and um, but besides that incident, um, there are no other similar incidents that um, would make us think of a Russian threat. I have also a question which is addressed to you. Russia nowadays 
is holding so-called referendums in the occupied territories of Donetsk, Lugansk, Zaporozhye, and Kharkiv. In order to justify the takeover of these territories and make them subjects of the Russian Federation, of the sovereignty of the Russian Federation. The annexation of these territories will prevent any negotiations between Ukraine and Russia. How great is the risk of Russia using tactical nuclear weapons? Can it be a real threat or it is just blackmail used by Russia as an element of information warfare? Yeah, thank you for your question, Mr. Minister. Uh, you know, it's always difficult to predict a Russian leadership. So that is why we are not confidently about the possibility to use a tactical nuclear weapon. Uh, at the same time, today Russia uh, has already, as you know, Sides is the Parisian nuclear power station and uh, has turned it into a nuclear terrorist state who forcibly keeps the plant under control. Uh, regularly bombards of station territory, uh, which can lead to the risk of damage uh, to the reactors and leakage of radioactive sub substantials. The Ukrainian proposal to demilitarize the station was left unanswered. We are waiting for the result of the uh, EIEA uh, inspection. Uh, and as you know, uh, it's difficult to now to uh, discuss in a more broader uh, uh, Sorry, it's some. It's okay, we hear you. Uh, it's difficult now to discuss uh, about uh, a possible uh, election in the uh, uh, Donetsk or Luhansk Oblast. It's, uh, as you know, it's uh, completely not in the line of uh, what our government is doing. And all of this uh, fake uh, election, it's just a part of, uh, as uh, Minister Danko rightly said, uh, a Russian uh, hybrid uh, war, which uh, we face and not uh, since February this year, but uh, already since 2014. Uh, so, uh, all of negotiation about uh, this territory are not uh, in a uh, uh, current agenda uh, between, I mean, between Russia and Ukraine. Ukraine definitely will continue to have all of military effort to liberate our territory uh, in a recognized international borders. It's actually will uh, of uh, all of Ukraine, and definitely we will continue uh, to uh, fight with uh, this uh, strong uh, enemy, but uh, uh, with uh, international help, with uh, international support, uh, we definitely will win. It will be our common victory. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, I will be more uh, precise talking about uh, NATO role. As you know, for the moment, NATO just limited uh, their help with uh, uh, non-little uh, systems and uh, uh, political support. Political support is very important for us. Uh, but it's time for, for the moment uh, uh, to return back to the format of new consultation, which unfortunately we cannot hold uh, for the long period of time. Uh, returning back to the consultation in the, in the new format, in the full scale of this format, it will be a great signal for the uh, Russia that uh, NATO uh, consolidated and uh, has a strong solidarity with Ukraine. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir.
Aș mai avea o ultimă întrebare care se îndreaptă spre Have one final question going to Minister Dâncu. România announced that uh, it will increase uh, its uh, budget for the defense to 2.5%. So uh, it shows that uh, Romania wishes to uh, invest in order to increase its uh, defense capacity. So what are the, its priorities given the challenges uh, at the Black Sea region due to the Russian aggression in Ukraine? Uh, that's a question we've been quite often asked of late. We also have an answer, uh, which I'm going to give to you. Uh, it's the same answer that was showcased in Ben's book. Uh, he was speaking there about ambition and money. We need these two elements. The announcement uh, of the, uh, made by the Romania's president about the increase of the defense budget to 2.5%, uh, which will also be approved by Romania's parliament, I believe, uh, due to our willingness to invest more in defense um, the general public is in favor uh, as well. So all this um, makes us uh, think about um, a couple of things. First of all, about the lessons learned from uh, the Ukrainian war, or the lessons we're trying to learn from this war. So we had uh, this concept of uh, an army of 24. Uh, 40 Romanian army, which had several phases. Well, that was a, a project of the past. We are now trying to um, advance uh, some deadlines. Uh, and because we are, we need to have a, a better perspective about the implementation of uh, rapid action plans, coming up with uh, technological uh, transfer solutions, um, with capability solutions, uh, uh, and uh, manufacturing here in Romania. We, I've been discussing with uh, my colleague, uh, Florence Pataru, Minister of Economy, about uh, uh, a uh, revitalizing of our position. Uh, President Pauliuk is currently working on a project uh, that's been uh, put to public debate. So we are trying to uh, see to what extent we can, through offset or competitive uh, uh, versions, uh, we'll be able to do all that. Uh, maybe we'll have a G2G program. So we'll see uh, if we are capable to make our defense industry uh, up to date. The defense ministry and uh, the economy ministry are working together to see what can be manufactured here in Romania. The COVID-19 pandemic taught us an important lesson. We were able to create uh, uh, supply chains, uh, and uh, we've learned from that. Uh, we've seen it from the discussion about uh, chips and uh, semiconductors. So we are trying to uh, continue all that in order to increase uh, the capabilities we already have and to accelerate procurement. We've started modernizing our army a few years back. We have a, a long-range missile system, Patriot. Uh, it's operational right now. We have uh, an armored uh, carrier for troops. Uh, and uh, we're trying to produce it uh, here in Romania. We have the HIMAR system. We have the two squadrons uh, that will be brought here. So these are uh, underway already. Uh, mobility. Uh, 
the revamping of our uh, Yare 99 planes. Uh, so there's, there's all that. Uh, we have um, uh, UAV systems uh, underway. We've submitted to Parliament the possibility to buy a couple of Bayraktar systems because they've proved to be efficient in the uh, Ukrainian war. So we are moving forward. I want to list here all our programs. Uh, they can be found on our website. So, uh, we are interested about the technological transfer, uh, tra uh, transfer about uh, the revigoration of research. Uh, after the Madrid summit, we had then a, we had then a fund, we have the European Agency for Defense, and we are trying to stimulate the Romanian research. Uh, the researchers to work together with European and NATO countries so that together we may be able to uh, manufacture new technologies here. Uh, which would be, of course, less costly. Uh, we have the uh, military research week, and uh, then we'll uh, try to uh, bring together all private and public resources because this integration, well, unfortunately, hasn't yet occurred. So it needs to happen. We need to invest in research. The, the state needs to invest in private research. And we are trying to efficiently use the NATO budget to allot at least 20% of it uh, to, uh, to the endowment of the army. Uh, had, for example, uh, we've invested 25% of the 2% that we used last year uh, towards that. Hopefully, we'll reach 30% of the budget we have because endowment is essential. We've seen some countries spend 75% of the defense budget uh, on their human resource people are indeed important. We are trying to um, improve the standard of living, to improve uh, military training. But uh, that being said, endowment is absolutely crucial. So this would be our future priorities. We are interested uh, in integration and interoperability within NATO. Of a 32,000 uh, uh, officers and uh, Romanian soldiers uh, were present uh, in, um, uh, in operation theaters throughout the world, in Afghanistan. We uh, really have a good human interoperability already, but we need to add uh, the technical side to it. So we will invest in uh, mutual applications with NATO. We have over 5,000 uh, soldiers present in Romania. They are not involved in uh, static actions, but uh, and, and we are uh, contributing to uh, mutual exercises which improve our uh, defense. This session, I should like to extend my gratitude to our colleagues and, if you allow me, friends from Ukraine. You succeeded to figure out one hour in order to discuss with us, and we know how complicated your situation is nowadays. But if you allow me, I should like to convey a special message to you. As I understood from what you have said, and the Minister of Defense of Ukraine also has stated, the motivation and tenacity of the Ukrainians is not only to fight, but to win. So, Mr. Vasile Dunko, I'd like to also thank you for your uh, complex uh, presentation, um, quite meaty one. Uh, 
for all the aspects you've underlined, uh, which are important and uh, very useful. Um, before uh, closing this panel, I uh, should like to uh, also comment on uh, what uh, Moscow sends as message. Uh, the Russian Federation signed a political treaty with Romania uh, in uh, 2003, and in Article 8 or 9, uh, it states that uh, whenever we have uh, will have security concerns. Uh, there will also be uh, mutual consultations. And uh, it will nothing will be publicly stated before previously discussing it. So we have a, a legal tool, a ratified tool, uh, which is legally bind. And this is good to know because, unfortunately, this kind of rhetoric will continue to flow from the Russian side. Thank you very much.